I'm Don Moores. Welcome to Montgomery Week in Review. The League of Women Voters of Maryland has a strong legislative agenda for the upcoming 2016 session of the Maryland State Legislature. Nancy Soren, the state co-president, is here to explain. Maryland's governor, the Honorable Larry Hogan, apparently has his own thoughts about where funding for children's issues should go in the upcoming year. Jane DeWinter, who comments for this program on a regular basis, has this story. Montgomery County is starting up a new public-private partnership called the Children's Opportunity Fund. Shirley Brandman, the interim director of the fund, is here to describe this new attempt that will uh, try to deal with the achievement gap that still exists in our county. This month's Beacon features several, several stories about estate planning, a subject of great importance to anyone who wants to ensure that their assets follow their wishes. Stuart Rosenthal, editor and publisher of The Beacon, will explain about this, these important stories as well as others in this month's Beacon. Nancy, welcome yeah. back. Hi, good to be here. Always a pleasure. Always great to see the statewide view from the league. We, we often will get county, the county, right. Montgomery County League Women Voters, which, which you were a big leader on. And now, as you are the leader, uh, co-president in the state, tell us what's going on with looking ahead at the 2016 sure. legislature. Well, in addition to the Montgomery County League, which mm -hmm. is the largest league in the state, we have leagues in Baltimore County, Baltimore City, on the Eastern Shore, mm -hmm. Western Maryland. And every year, we ask all of these leagues around the state what they think we ought to be working on in Annapolis the coming session. They give us feedback, then we send it back out again, say this is what the other leagues did, and then we finally end up with a list of priorities. Well, our leagues want us to do a lot. So we have three main areas okay. we're going to work go, on. Let's go through each of them individually. Okay. And then, and then throw them open for question, maybe. Okay, so the Good. first one is just like making democracy work. It has to do with our efforts to reform the redistricting process, overturn the veto of the governors that would not, um, that would have allowed felons to vote as soon as they were no longer incarcerated. Right. has to do with uh, automatic voter registration. Okay. You know, Oregon and California have started that. We want to bring that to Maryland. We want people to be able to vote. And, 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 and I know with your, your own anti-gerrymandering efforts, <laughs> um, and we want people to be voting in, in districts that, that represent a commonality right. of interests and not just trying to right. The whole solve. idea is to make participation in democracy easy, to make democracy transparent. Good. There's a lot all of right. transparency. That's one. What's two? Two is protecting the environment. We all know climate change is upon us. Uh, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act needs to be renewed this year. It's been a yeah. great driver. And uh, also uh, requiring the utilities to purchase more clean energy is another one of our priorities. Now, as we go through these, there's a website people can go to, follow along, or... or you can go to lwvmd.org, okay. click on advocacy or publications, or maybe both places, and subscribe to our, our journal called Report from State Circle. Every two weeks, uh, it comes out, and all of our legislative priorities and the bills relating to those and what's happening with them is described there. All right, before we open this up for questions with, I know people, okay. a lot, there are a lot of questions here. What's your third priority? The third one has to do with making sure that there's adequate resources to continue to fund the programs for our vulnerable populations, some of which are children, some of which are seniors, some of which are people with disabilities. But uh, every year, you know, cuts have happened. Now we finally are getting a, a little bit better in a budget situation. We want to make sure that money is there to maybe backfill some of the cuts that have been happening instead of having it just go away. So Nancy, these issues, are there bills that have already been filed that you are following or you're trying to encourage legislators to move um, forward on, on these the issues? automatic voter registration, there are, th are three bills already, uh, one from uh, Delegate Lucky in the House, one from Senator Mano, and one from Senator Ramirez. They're all slightly different. Mm -hmm. We're going to be trying to work with them to come up with the best combination. Um, redistricting reform, I haven't seen the legislation yet. There's been lots of bills in the past that went nowhere, but now we've got the governor behind us and his commission has made some good recommendations. Certainly the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act, that bill's already been dropped as well as uh, increasing the renewable portfolio standards. So yeah, this is all happening. On the, f on the funding thing, it's more like defense though. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the redistricting, how, mm. how do we stop or how do we keep Maryland from the, the, the you know, attack on either side? So one person's bad districting or bad uh, boundary drawing uh -huh. uh, then turns into the other party's bad uh, uh, drawing. Uh, how do we get something like California where well, we get into a Well, the recommendation is to have an independent commission that's balanced, that has no majority from any party on it, that has, uh, in addition to people from the minority party, the majority party, uh, people that are either unaffiliated or from another party, and have them actually draw the lines with some very specific criteria about what would make a good district that would represent people. Uh, I haven't seen the legislation yet, but we're 
hope it works. No, but when you have that criteria in a state that's largely democratic, it really means that fewer people are overrepresented, doesn't it? You know, I'm really not sure how it's going to come out. Um, I, I, I just know that the processes as of right now have totally lacks transparency, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it ends up with districts that are drawn for the benefit of particular politicians instead of the benefit of the voters that live in those districts. If we had districts that were more compact, more contiguous, mm -hmm. uh, respected political boundaries more, mm -hmm. I think it would be better for the voters. Yeah. And that's I what think we're supporting. Governor O'Malley really pushed the envelope when he last time and yeah. he got crazy mm -hmm. uh, district and I think everybody's decided that that's just too far and they yeah. have mm -hmm. to come back and, and I, I hope I, that happens. I, right, I think it should be about the voters, not about the politicians. Mm -hmm. And um, the Virginia League is working very much in the same way and they have kind of the opposite situation. They've got a, a, Republic, a Democratic governor, a Republican legislature, mm -hmm. But they also want to have redistricting reform. So, so um, beyond yeah. establishing this platform, are you do you try to mobilize people to be in Annapolis to be going face to face? Actually, yeah, we've been going around doing. Um, we've got a slideshow presentation. We've been collecting petitions. We're keeping up a database so that when legislation does come through, we can activate these people to mm -hmm. get involved. Mm -hmm. And there's many, many Democrats that do support redistricting mm -hmm. reform because they believe in good government. So it sounds like that's when you think we'll actually move. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Nancy, uh, looking ahead, uh, May, you come back here uh -huh. uh, and you say that you've succeeded. Define success for us. For what, as you look ahead, what, what would be success for the League's uh, efforts in this legislature? Okay, well, two that I'm pretty hopeful on are the, the two environmental issues that we're working on. We worked on really hard. If we don't renew this Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act, we're sunk and we're stupid. So I think that I think we'll do that as, as well as um, increasing the renewable portfolio standard. The Commission, Maryland Climate Commission, recommended that, and so I think that will okay. go through. More awareness on the redistricting issue would be a good okay. plus. All right, Nancy, thank you. Uh -huh. I look forward to having you come back and maybe give a you know uh, 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 update during the session sure. or, or afterwards. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks, Jane. Welcome back. Thank you. So tell us what is going on. Well, there's a new guy in town. Only he's not so new anymore, but um, he has. We're I talking mean, about the, gov the governor. Governor Hogan. Yes, yes. Right? And um, of course, uh, you know, in Maryland, it's not just the fact that, okay, there's a new man, but it's that he's, uh, you know, the party affiliation has switched. And so this uh -huh. is really, um, although he was around and, you know, involved in last year's budget, this is really. His first, you know, the first, first going. First, yeah. yeah um, mm -hmm. going through the whole year. And so um, there have been some changes. I mean, we, we know that last year the geographic um, cost of education index was not funded by now the that's, governor. And that's right. something to try to, to balance out the, the yeah. needs, the costs. What's, what does that mean? Yes, well, it's cost? the index itself is just a measure of, of need based on the cost of living, cost okay. of educating, as well as you know some of the other factors that you know can make uh, the children uh, you know have higher barriers okay. to learning, and um, it primarily impacts you know Montgomery County, Prince George's County, mm -hmm. where you know it's more expensive. I mean we know that we um, uh, you know teachers are paid more. The cost of living is here, okay. and so it's an effort to balance that out. And um, it was not the governor did not fund it last year. Well, the and funds were there. The funds he would were not there. Right, he released. would release it. Yes, I mean, but he initially didn't right. want to fund it. Didn't the legislature but pass a law that requires them to do it this year? Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. So that's but. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. You know, I mean, and and frankly, you know, I don't want to lay that all on his feet because even with Governor O'Malley, mm -hmm. it took him a few years right. to fund it, even though uh, you know he had promised he would, and mm -hmm. then he didn't. Um, okay, so so no. we got lots of things. What what else right. in the budget? Looking well, ahead of governor? another thing, oh, okay. I, I think another big thing is that many people maybe have never even heard of the governor's office on children, but that um, establishes priorities. Okay. It does kind of try to. Um, uh, coordinate efforts from other government, uh, you know, various government agencies who are working on children and family issues. And Governor Hogan has redirected some of the priorities of that office. Um, under Governor O'Malley, one priority was um, student achievement as well as preparing students for school college okay. and and uh, career. That the state was trying to right. promote that. So the state would promote right. that through, I mean, okay. really through money, mm -hmm. through what they were going to fund. Right. And uh, and then there were other things. But let's talk about what Governor Hogan knows. Right. So Governor Hogan 
uh, um, has f announced as his focus, uh, one, addressing displaced or disconnected youth. So mm -hmm. it's really focusing on older youth who are not connected to any school or employment center. So it's an admirable goal. It's difficult mm -hmm. to, I mean, the whole okay. problem is, is it difficult. hard yeah. to identify. And then the second one is um, uh, addressing the needs of children and family when their parents are incarcerated. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, people are viewing that as really an effort to move money away from our area towards, say, Baltimore. Mm. 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 Yeah. So, so, good. so oh, I think the challenges are always when you have a shift like this is that a county starts to invest in a particular direction if you have to kind of move mm -hmm. your priorities so there'll be an impact there although I will say that with respect to disconnected youth our own community foundation the Montgomery County Community Foundation has just released two reports that they helped fund looking at Latino students and mm -hmm. African American students at this population the sort of 16 to 24 mm -hmm. year old so there is sort of a, a joining a, you know a recognition that this is a tough group of you know young adults who we do really need to serve the question is are there good ideas and money going to flow to have an impact yeah. right and and i mean i know identity has been working for a number of years to raise that as an issue with latino youth and and develop programs to address that i think that um from probably the montgomery county perspective i mean it's a good thing to have a focus be there but yes the question is will funding and good programs follow and what is it dis what is the funding displacing? Because I don't think governors, I don't think his intent is to increase the right. overall funding. So what's frustrating then is that these are all admirable goals and they all should be supported. And to have to see mm -hmm. things switch from one to another without the continuity of continuing what's been started is, is mm -hmm. always a frustrating mm -hmm. challenge. And a, big, a left. and a big thing that's um, a, a real impact is going to have is on the county's Excel Beyond the Bell program, which is an effort to bring after school programming um, a, to nine Montgomery County middle schools and they're you know trying to expand to more which is really more of a preventative measure mm -hmm. you know keep the kids engaged rather than chasing after them after they're disengaged and, and a really important one because when you mm -hmm. you know we all talk about the opportunity gap and families that can afford mm -hmm. to offer their children experiences after school invest in those mm -hmm. but many kids do rely on the programs that the county can mm -hmm. pay for to make that available right and so the the shift from the governor's office of children um, right now they're estimating that that's going to be cutting the funding for that program mm -hmm. in half. Okay. Well, Jane, this is a serious issue that I, I know you're going to be covering and, and following. Mm -hmm. I look forward to getting a report on future uh, shows. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. We'll be right back after these messages. We're back. Shirley, welcome back. Thank you. Happy New so Year. So the Children's Opportunity Fund, what, what is that? Because this is brand new. It is. It's brand new and it's just getting started. So the real vision here is this is a joint effort, school system and the county government, looking to set up a public-private partnership. So this is recognizing that the county sees in the work that we do that there are many areas that we would like to serve, particularly low-income children and their families, that we're simply not going to get to because we don't have all the resources and we don't have all the capacity. Okay. So it's a vision of a fund modeled on some children's trusts across the nation mm -hmm. where we really open up and invite in private partners. We leverage public dollars to bring in private support, philanthropy, business, to invest in things that we have a strong reason to believe are going to give us return on investment. So, looking so, we're, look, for, so we're looking at, the, so you've got the core. You've got the of, core. And then, and so we're filling in gaps. Right. So this is not money going into the school system's budget. This is not more funding to MCPS. This is not triggering a maintenance of effort obligation going forward. But this is recognizing that there are things we know now predict predict the achievement gap. We know that kids who don't get into high quality preschool. We know that low income students who over the summer don't have any experiences and aren't okay. stimulated lose ground in their learning and that only aggravates Let's the achievement. Let's stop right there so one who, second. Who so will set so the priorities for what programs you're going to do? So part of what is unique about the vision for this Children's Opportunity Fund is that we're asking some of our leaders, our county executive, our superintendent, member of the council, member of the Board of Education, because in their work they're constantly seeing where they would like the county to go and we just can't get there, that they will share some visions of policy and directions. 
So they will help say, you know, we really see a need that we're not getting to, which is a different mm -hmm. model than when we have wonderful nonprofits that have ideas about how to serve children and families coming forward and asking a partner. So this would really be them setting a big agenda, but then bringing in a group of community advisors to say, within that goal, what are some proven interventions? They're very much looking to invest in things that are evidence-based. So for example, right out of the box, Councilwoman Nancy Navarro worked with the Josh Rails Foundation. Josh Rails Foundation's putting up over four years, $3 million that the county is gonna match in public funds. And the idea is to bring in a program that's a nationally established program called Bell, Building Educated Learners for Life. And they will set up a summer reading program that targets kids who are growing up in poverty, who would otherwise, without this exposure, be, probably lose ground. They are focusing it in the summers around third grade because we know that reading mm -hmm. on grade level by third grade is an important predictor of future success. Mm -hmm. They're going to target a thousand students a summer for each of four years. And the idea is to really take advantage of their expertise, bring them in. Their program has been evaluated already by the Urban Institute, so right. we have a high reason to believe it'll work. And invest in those kinds of programs that we know will get, will move the needle basically on the achievement gap. Sure. And there are, you know, um, I know probably a lot of people heard of the book Bowling Alone yes. by Robert Putnam, and he last year came out with a book Our called Kids, Kids which is really discussing what are some of these factors impacting the achievement gap that people don't really think about. It's so and true, and you know, and he talks about the opportunity gap for mm -hmm. kids, and that really mm -hmm. is when you think about summer learning loss, again, you think about families who have means are providing opportunities and exposure for students. Here's a statistic that's, to me, really shocking. It, back in the 1970s, when people looked at the differential per child that a family of means might spend on their child compared to a low-income mm -hmm. family, the difference was about $2,800 per child. By 2006, that had grown to roughly $7,800. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing, you know, and again, no one's faulting parents who have means for investing in their kids, but we're recognizing that there are a lot of things that kids don't get exposed mm -hmm. to that are sometimes outside the purview of school mm -hmm. time, but that have an impact. So let's return real quick to early childhood yes. education. Uh, you, you can't be, I mean, are, are you thinking about through this fund of, of providing the entirety of early education? I doubt that we're going to get there just on this fund, but for doing? example, well, so if you took as a marker, right, if we wanted to make a commitment and say every child's going to read on grade level by third grade, you start to think down to what influences that. Right. And you would think about more preschool. Maybe you'd expand some of our half-day preschool to full day. Maybe you'd right. go down to three. About a minute to you, go. You'd think about dental, dental um, health for children because okay. actually when you look at absences in kindergarten and first grade, it's dental and asthma that keep kids absent. Mm -hmm. You think about summer learning. Loss. You might focus on after-school programs at the elementary level with a literacy component because you want to support as many kids to hit a target that you'll know will impact them in the future. So it's about evidence-based, scalable, proven investments, public dollars, leveraging private dollars to serve our kids and hit our goals. And looking at organizations that are already out there, like the, like the, the Absolutely. Public, you know, we've got, we've got health uh, organizations, dental organizations. I mean, do you pull them in? Absolutely. To in fact, one of the national campaigns we're looking at is based with pediatricians called Reach Out and Read, where every well visit up through your four years, your pediatrician gives you a book and some guidance for how to stimulate reading with your kids. That's one we're looking at. We're thinking about joining. Annie Casey has a grade level reading network to bring together communities that are committed. Surely this is great. It's fun. And just like with the prior two guests, previous two guests, we look forward to getting a, an update uh, in Absolutely. the coming weeks, months uh, on, on how it's going. Congratulations on being interim director. Thanks. And, uh, and good luck. Thanks. Now we have Stuart. Hey, Don. <laughs> how are you? Thank God. Good. Yourself? Good. I'm doing well. Thank you very much. This is one of the highlights of our program. Every month you're here, uh, the Beacon, telling us about what's in that month's Beacon. And, and this is, we've got some exciting stories. Why don't we start with the estate planning, and right. then I know you've got some health-related ones right. that we want to talk about as well. We thought we'd start the year with a series of articles on how to really gather together and be sure you're on top of all of your estate planning documents and, and that you have your plan all set up. So that we have one story, a very simple story is, you know, and everybody wants to know this, what things can I throw out that I don't need to have cluttering up my house and, and what do I need to really hold on to and for how long? So okay. just a very basic, you know, this and this and this and this. Okay. okay. A bigger story, I think, is one that says, so what are the estate planning documents you really need to have? Because mm -hmm. not all of us have what we need, okay? And, then, and, and the real question to ask yourself is, and where are they? Do you know where they are, and does your family know where they are, and does your executor-to-be know where they are? Because that's what's really going to be important. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have uh, documents with your beneficiaries and your insurance papers and your 
your living will and your health care power of attorney, right. financial power of attorney, and all these documents that are going to determine how you're taken care of if for some reason you should become incapacitated, perhaps right. temporarily, uh, and certainly when you die where your assets are going to go. I mean, f do you have all those documents? And then aren't they, when you think about it, aren't they like in a million places? I know so ours is there a are. suggestion about the best way to yes. get it? Yes. Okay. Yes. okay, so yes. some very yes. practical suggestions. Yeah. And the third article is well, on websites. They can help you do this. <laughs> we yeah. need to tell us what's the best way to do You know, websites have thought of this problem, right? And they've come up with really nice solutions. So mm -hmm. a couple of them, I mean, you have to pay a little something for them, but they, you can upload all your documents. They're mm -hmm. encrypted. Uh, and then you can determine who gets access to this information and when. Mm -hmm. So you can say, so-and-so gets access to the information of what I want my funeral to be like or whatever, you know. Right. But so-and-so is the only one who gets access to my financial power of attorney, and they only get it if I'm incapacitated, you know. Mm -hmm. So you can yeah. put all these, you know, restrictions mm -hmm. on it, and then when the time comes, you tell them what the website is mm -hmm. so they know that at least, and they all have to do is go to the website well, and that's a good get lead access into to a comment it. I was going to make, which is you need to also make sure that somebody knows all of your computer passwords yes. to every oh, single yeah. online yes. account, passwords, everything, and where that your you safe have. deposit box yes. key, all exactly, all yes. that's all in there. So yeah. some people would say, well, now you know, I don't really mm -hmm. want that information. Even you tell me it's encrypted, you have right, you know, and uh -oh. you know, things have been hacked right and left every day. So I don't know that I want to put all of that information online. God forbid, everything gets taken away from me before you know, before I want it to be. Well, so, it's so for that solution, there are websites that say. You don't have to put the information up here. You just have to say where it is, right. yeah. and you restrict people to know, you know, who gets access to that information. Then they have to, they have to break into your house too to find it. <laughs> well, and as your family disperses and your kids are all over, right. they can access it from wherever they are. Right. Let me ask you this question: uh, In looking at this, there's so many, you know, online efforts. You, you've got these lawyers. You can get a package. You don't have to spend money on a lawyer. All this. It, it sounds pretty confusing. You've got lawyers who are all over the place in terms of whether they're good, bad, or ugly. What do you suggest? I mean, should somebody go to an attorney? Is it worth investing an hour and in, in understanding? You know, I'm a former attorney. Right. <laughs> so um, I'm glad I'm not one now, but I do think one needs an attorney for certain kinds of things, and that's very important. I mean, you can really mess yourself up uh, with a will or a lack of will or trust or whatever in these kinds of matters. So I would definitely go to a reasonable attorney who understands what they're doing. You don't have to go to the $500 an hour guys necessarily, mm -hmm. but find somebody who get, has a well, reasonable price. Well, also it price. seems like things change too. I mean, we went to one 10 or 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and now I'm thinking of things that, oh, I should mm -hmm. change, but I don't know if I mm -hmm. want to spend another Well, that's another <laughs> thing about having a lawyer, because if you have a lawyer who prepared a will, they will contact <coughs> you and say, you know, things have changed. I think yeah. it's time we update well, your and will. The uh, other plus for having doing this through an attorney is that you know, even if you have all your ducks in a row, when you pass, if you've named an executor, there's paperwork that a lawyer has to do to make that, you know, make the appointment go through. If you have a trust and the and the right. trustees changing, right. Right. it's yeah. still law. So if you're set up that there's a lawyer who has all that paperwork. Right. You know. And the article says you should also make sure that the name of the lawyer who prepared it, yeah. or the professional, is involved, is there. <laughs> because sometimes <laughs> there are going to be concerns or debates or confusions right. or whatever, and right. you want to be able to go to the person who put it together who's going to know what you wanted and be right. able to so defend all these, it. So all these know. stories, these are in stories in the beacon, and then we also have some right. health stories. We've got about a minute left, so this is Well, important. actually, I was going to talk about uh, my column, if you don't mind. Sure. I, I decided to write about uh, prescription drug costs. Um, it's, it's an issue we all know about, but I mean, particularly, there was an AP story that really got my blood boiling. Um, hepatitis C is a serious, a serious issue, right? It, it can be fatal for a lot of people. It, it strikes baby boomers and it's growing in its incidence because it's, it's contagious, right? It, um, there, there's a, they came up with a, with a solution, a real cure for the first time, a nice drug that will cure it in 90% of cases. The people who, who have patented and, and made this drug available are charging $84,000. To, for a course of treatment. Sure. Now, they say, wow. look, it, it, it would cost $100,000 or more if you needed a kidney transplant or if you had a lifelong need for all these other kinds of drugs. We're saving your money. It's $15,000 less than if you went the old route. You should be happy. Well, <laughs> guess what? This drug was developed with NIH and, and, and uh, Scottish funding, uh, and it's available for $300 in India because they refused to give it patent protection because they said, look, this was, this was developed by That's the government. That's the last word. We need to talk about those issues, though. They're very important. We're going to come back and talk about that next all time. All right. All right. Thanks, all right. Stuart. Thank all of you for thank joining you. me. And thank, I want to thank all of you and the viewing audience for joining us for this week's edition of Montgomery Week in Review. I'm Don Moores, inviting you to join us next week at this very same time.